AI, Artificial Intelligence is a 2002 movie from Steven Spielberg made in between Saving Private Ryan and Minority Report, and those were in between Catch Me If You Can and Amistad, aka Spielberg's attempt at wringing every possible Oscar out of the Academy until they were a cold, lifeless shell of a geriatric organization that used to be entirely unpredictable about how they measured art. Oh, wait! No, you're right. The Academy of old white dudes who like films about World War II, the King's Speech was totally better than Black Swan, Inception, The Social Network, Toy Story. Story 3, True Grit, and Winter's Bone. I liked that bit so much that I did the joke the second way. No, you're right, the Academy of Puffed Up Geriatric History Buffs of Male Caucasian Dominance, Shakespeare in Love was totally better than Elizabeth Life is Beautiful, The Thin Red Line, and Saving Private What the f***? That movie be two World War II movies? How is that even possible? Saving Private Ryan is one of the best movies ever. Oh, it had Ben Affleck in it. They love giving Oscars to Ben Affleck. And so I basically aimed to drive home the point that Spielberg was on his game at this point. But this movie was not really celebrated upon its release. It was met with mixed reviews, some pulling no punches, and I quote, an unsettling sci-fi fairy tale melange of Pinocchio and the Wizard of Oz that's elegantly written, visually opulent, and thematically challenging and discontented. One of Spielberg's finest and most fiercely misread film. Oh, no, wait. No, hang on. That's like the most positive thing ever. I thought everybody hated this movie that Ryan Schaefer called flawed to be sure but beautifully crafted unimaginably complex visually dazzling rich with metaphor and deeply if what the hell stop loving this movie critics you kind of step out on my game here i was the guy i i celebrate movies that people didn't like the first yeah. Otter still, one of the most positive quotes about the film came from none other than arguably the most influential director of all time billy wilder saying it was the most underrated movie in years hmm why does it feel like everyone hates this movie then? Basically, it's just a movie where a robot kid named David thinks if he finds the blue fairy, then she'll turn him into a real boy in the movie's overly simplistic, obvious Pinocchio metaphor that carries with it all the layered nuance of Guy Fieri's guy Italian nachos. Wait, no, that motherfucker put turkey, pepperoni, and ricotta cheese on not- No! Get his people on the phone! Get his people on the phone right fuck! In 1970, Stanley Kubrick began to work on an adaptation of the short story, Super Toys Last All Summer Long. Not a whole lot happened on it other than a few treatments of a script until 1985 when Kubrick asked his friend Steven Spielberg to produce the movie with him. The film continued to labor in development hell until 1989 when they fired Brian Aldiss because he'd been working on the screenplay treatment for what the fuck? 14 years? 14 years? You could carry a baby from the first trimester to puberty in that time. Oh, wait, he did. Oh, uh, sorry, Max. You, you were an AI baby. Seriously, stay tuned because this weird train is stopping at every station. Okay, so there were a couple more writers working with Kubrick on the adaptation for a few more years. Seriously, one of the writers took the Joe character from a GI Mecca, that's the word they used, Mecca's a robot in the movie, and decided that he should be the male prostabot Gigolo Joe, to which Kubrick remarked, I guess we lost the kitty market. Oh, and Kubrick was super worried about special effects being advanced enough to make this movie until, you guessed it, Jurassic Park came out. It was Spielberg that gave Kubrick the confidence to make the movie in the first place, and I can't stress enough that these two people were friends. Kubrick had trouble pre-visualizing the visual effects from the movie to such an extent that in 1995, he tried to convince his friend to direct it because it was more akin to Steven's sensibilities than his own. Let that sink in for a moment. Kubrick wanted Spielberg to direct this movie because he thought it was more in his wheelhouse. In 1995, Spielberg actually convinced Kubrick that he should remain on as the director. And then Eyes Wide Shut happened, which was the last film Kubrick made. Spielberg, feeling the weight of this loss, began working on the screenplay for the movie, his first screenplay since Close Encounters in 1977. And the movie began filming in 2000, which was only a year after Kubrick's death. And a lot of this movie is really about how hard it is dealing with grief. I, I, I feel like Spielberg agreed to do this movie movie just because he missed his friend. It's that simple. Okay, what is it about? Well, density for one. This film is denser than Guy Fieri's barbecue buffalo meatloaf. You can't put ranch dressing in a meatloaf, you big bald f- Hey, Clark Gregg's in this movie. You want to know how to enjoy this movie? Don't think of it as a Steven Spielberg movie. He sure didn't. Watch this film like it's the last movie that Kubrick ever made because in almost any category you can think of, it was. It's naturally lit, shot on pretty much the same film stock that Kubrick used. Ain't nobody gonna tell me this doesn't look like a Kubrick movie. Compare it to Barry Lyndon, and it becomes entirely obvious. 
It has John Williams basically paying homage to as many Kubrick films as he can. This movie is so Kubrick, it still managed to challenge my beliefs this many years after the fact. This movie is so dark, it's pitch black. It's not uplifting in any way. Uh, I'm not talking about that ending yet. I gotta get us there. Slowly, at a measured pace, like an R. Kelly lawsuit. Got him! Let's talk about the nature of identity. David is a new type of mecha invented to help grieving parents deal with the loss of a child. But in the future, the one where AI takes place, the parent's existing child, Martin, is frozen in case that a cure for whatever is wrong with him is ever invented. He's effectively dead, but we'll get back to that. Here's what this movie is actually about. If you design an artificial intelligence to imprint on a parental host using a predetermined string of consonants, it will spend its entire existence attempting to love that person regardless of human parameters and understanding of time. It will literally spend an eternity attempting to earn the love of a grieving parent. But as I said, this is a Kubrick movie. So the kid they're grieving over in the first place, the kid in cryo comes back to life and it turns out he's a paste-eating sack of semi-automatic dick rifles. The prodigal son, so to speak, is the real problem child. Here's the thing. For the time they had together, David and his mother had a surprisingly deep, loving connection to one another. But once Martin is brought back to life, with a miracle cure no less, no matter the nature of David's programming, it cannot account for the nigh-limitless edge cases that a jealous child can create to make it look like a mecha is actually out to harm someone. But chew on it this way. The film cleanly disproves Asimov's three laws because those laws presuppose that a robot can be aware that it's allowing a human to come to harm. But again, there's no possible way that the programmatical systems of an AI can account for the effectively infinite number of edge cases where a human might be in danger. It doesn't even have the knowledge not to hurt itself. I'm saying nothing about this is David's fault. It's entirely his brother's. It's Martin that is fully aware of what his manipulations are doing to David and is consciously and gleefully putting his mother in danger again and again. And she loves David, but she has no choice but to turn him back into the company that made him for decommissioning and disposal. But she has a mother's love for for her son, but she chooses instead to abandon him in the forest in the most gut-wrenching scene you'll ever watch. Haley Joel Osment was fresh out the sixth sense at this point. I'm astounded he wasn't nominated for an Academy Award again. He's an abandoned robot that has to put together that he's being abandoned right in front of our eyes. No, Just look no, at his performance no, in this scene. No, you, no, no, mommy, please, no, no, please, no, please, no, no I would mommy, destroy no, you, David, no, David, no, David, mommy, I'm gonna mommy, destroy you. I'm sorry, I broke my soul. I'm so sorry, I cut your hair off, and I'm, I'm sorry, no, I hurt you, and no, 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 I, I have to go, I have, I have to go. Humans are the real villains in this movie. This is never obscured from the audience. They are mostly shown as psychopaths that delight in the destruction of others. Hello, the flesh fair. We humans delight in the destruction of autonomous beings that beg for their lives. Like watching the nanny bot get melted. I actually had to take a break when watching this film. It's really disturbing. Oh, and right before they're gonna kill David, this woman says, Mecca don't plead for their lives. Ignoring the fact that literally every single robot we see in the flesh fair scene pleads for exactly that. Only when David begs the audience not to melt him do they acquiesce. This movie thinks humans are dumb. But did you know? This movie was originally going to be called simply AI, but surveys revealed that people thought it said A1. The people they surveyed thought the title of this movie was a steak sauce. Like multiple people said that. <sighs> Okay, what's this? This movie isn't a cheap Pinocchio metaphor. It's an entirely new fairy tale. David's obsession is with the blue fairy and becoming a real boy because his brother wanted him to think that. But actually, there are other fairy tales referenced all over this movie. Hell, his mother is freaking humming a dream is a wish your heart makes from Cinderella. An all too fitting song when you think about it. You know who's smart? Albert Einstein. You know what he said? This. You know who's in this movie? Albert Einstein. You know who plays him? Robin Williams. But did you know? The Robin Williams cameo is one of the most widely criticized Spielbergy things in the entire movie, and I'm about to blow your f***ing mind. Not only was Robin Williams playing this character Stanley Kubrick's idea, he actually directed and recorded it himself before his death. Spielberg barely touched that 
scene. And I can't even imagine how far outside of Spielberg's comfort zone this film was to make. There's some very sexually charged imagery and plot points throughout the film. Hey, Entourage is in this movie, whatever. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, the ending. Here we go. It was Kubrick that wrote this ending. It's shot exactly as it was in the original treatment he gave to Spielberg, but it makes me sad that people don't understand it, and I'm aiming to fix that right now. Also, it makes me sad because this is like the single most depressing ending of any movie of all time. Yes, more depressing than The Mist. Yes, more depressing than Arlington Road. Yes, more depressing than Requiem for a Dream. Buckle up. This shit is about to get bleak. Once David arrives in New York, a place his inventor lied through the Einstein machine to get David there, he realizes, unlike a real boy, he is not special, unique, or worthy of love because he is simply a cheap imitation of a boy that used to exist. Did I mention the polar ice caps have melted due to global warming so New York is a place no one goes anywhere because it's completely submerged in water? Anyway, David no longer has a reason to live because his mother abandoned him and his dream of becoming a real boy has been dashed, so he jumps off the building to kill himself. <sighs> Gigolo Joe rescues him, only to be captured immediately after and eventually killed, but David thinks he sees the blue fairy in a submerged Coney Island, so he ventures to the bottom of the ocean and waits in front of an old statue he thinks will save him, which promptly crushes him under a Ferris wheel. He begs the blue fairy to make him a real boy, and then he waits for 2,000 years. A second ice age. He's discovered by beings that appear as aliens. Now I said appear, not are aliens because they are artificial intelligence that has evolved to the point they are no longer recognizable as anything but aliens. You want proof of that? When David is first shown in the movie, he appears out of focus exactly as the beings do because they're the same thing. In this future, all of the humans are dead, replaced by a life form of our own creation evolving itself over thousands of years into something we would never recognize as our own. Kind of like how David's parents create something that becomes unrecognizable as even a human because his brother is a draft smoking adjective something weird. He's a dumbass. Oh, and David accidentally obliterates the blue fairy because he, ne he needed some bad news about now. The life forms then search his memories and find that he had a single wish that never came true. And because he is their ancestor, they grant him that wish by implanting his mind with a false reality that he gets to be with his mother again. They even create a blue fairy in this reality so he can finally be convinced that he cannot become a real boy. Oh, and they tell him that his mother is dead because he's been gone for so long. Man, you guys totally nailed it. This is that typical Spielberg happy ending bullshit, am I right? Luckily, because Teddy still has a lock of David's mother's hair, the beings are able to bring back his mother for a single day. Once a recreated person falls asleep, the fabric of reality causes their consciousness to fail, killing them again once they fall asleep. But that's not actually what's happening here. That's just what they're saying is happening. This is the fairy tale ending that David wanted. The one day space time reality upset thing is just a ruse to give David one last moment of peace and happiness before they euthanize him. I'm not joking. There's no plausible reality where that actually is her hair and they could use the DNA to create anything. It's just a ruse to make him believe it's real. Teddy would not have had the hair for that long. There's no way it would have survived without somewhere to store it, especially underwater for 2,000 years years. And the thing is, Teddy is not a specialized robot created for any purpose. Teddy is a toy. Teddy would not be alive 2,000 years in the future, surviving in a high moisture environment that would absolutely turn everything inside of him to rust. There's no way this is real. They are simply lying to him because they're about to turn him off and they want him to have his fairy tale ending before he's dead. A fact David, and I wish the audience, was acutely aware of. If you want for my happiness, then you know what you have to do. But he doesn't care. Because against his will, against any desires he must have, he is required by the parameters of his imprinting that he must love his mommy with all of his heart forever, regardless of however much she has abandoned him. So he spends one final day in a montage narrated as if it's a fairy tale, because that's his only happy ending. He hugs his mother goodbye and lays down to go to sleep, and then they turn him off. So the next time somebody brings up that this movie had some crazy bullshit Spielberg ending, maybe casually remind them that the good guys in this movie were the robots and the bad guys in this movie was, you know, us humans, and we all died! <laughs> Thanks for checking out the new episode of Movies of Mikey. Hopefully the next one will be up within the month. Until then, if you guys could subscribe to the channel and help us out, that would be really good. Please like the video. Please share it with your friends. You know, 
tell a hermit uh, in in a nearby cave if you if you happen upon one. Now, AI was the first movie that I actually took with an audience vote, so I thought we would do that again. Uh, so here you go. There's the three new movies. One uh, is a holdover from last time, and then there's two new ones. And last but not least, please check out the movies of Mikey spinoff show, Hot Takes, with me and my buddy Thaddeus. We tried to find everything good in a very bad movie in our first episode about The Last Airbender, so check that out. I will see you guys next time.